One of the likely big topics of discussion this week is the proliferation of hypersonic weapons and where the U.S. stands in relation to our near-peer adversaries. I recently had the chance to sit down with Lockheed Martin's Director of Air Dominance and Strike Weapons Advanced Programs and discuss their entry into the discussion, the MAKO. Mako's fastest shark in the ocean. So uh, we started this seven years ago, came up with a clever name for it. But the, the more clever part was uh, coming from where I had just come uh, in uh, operational tests for the United States Navy and Marine Corps, where we went out and uh, evaluated the latest weapon systems for the Navy. Uh, Coming from that, I, I knew that there were some capability gaps, and that's a fancy way of saying requirements. Capability gap is uh, red, can do a certain uh, mission. Uh, blue, the U.S. can do a certain mission. If there's a gap there, then we want to close that gap. That becomes a, a big R requirement. And by red and, and blue, red is op force, blue is friendly force. Red's our adversary, yes, and, and blue is the U.S. Uh, and our allies. Uh, knew that there was a capability gap out there across various mission areas and wanted to close that gap with a single weapon. So about seven years ago in 2017, uh, since then, we've spent, uh, you know, it's $150 million investment, seven years of work with the government uh, and internally with Lockheed Martin. And it MAKO is a, a weapon that happens to be hypersonic. Hypersonic isn't a weapon, right? That, that hypersonic is a speed, uh, but it's a weapon that was developed to be multi-mission, multi-platform, multi-domain. What the heck does that mean? Multi-mission means, uh, you know, uh, taking out ships, taking out tanks, taking out air defenses, um, really any mission that you can think of. Multi-platform is this weapon literally can hang on anything that has 30 inch lugs. So we fit on all the teenagers, F, F-18, F-16, F-15, all the bombers out there, mobility platform like C-17 and, and C-130. So being able to be delivered via palletized. And yes, uh, and then internally and externally on internally on our fifth generation platforms, F-22 and F-35, we've, we've done those uh, physical fit checks and then and hanging externally on those platforms. And then multi-domain. What does that mean? Well, we've been talking about air launched here, but what about surface launch, which is maritime, which is from the ocean? What about ground launched from the land? What about subsurface launch uh, from a submarine? So it, it's really, it's the one ring to rule them all. It packs quite a punch in the end game. The, the missile itself is the missile of 13. It's 1,300 pounds. It's 13 and a half inches in diameter. It's got a 130 pound warhead and it's 13 feet long. The hypersonic component. I mean, so there's so much talk about China's hypersonic weapons, their missiles, uh, like the DZ-17 or whatever they call it now. Um, when, when you set out to do this seven years ago, that necessarily all of the hypersonic talk wasn't taking up all the, the airwaves as it is now. Um, so was the, the differences, I guess, I mean, for, for the layman, when they see hypersonic or hear hypersonic, it's just super fast. Right. So how does, right. <laughs> how does the Mako differ than the Chinese version of a hypersonic weapon? Mach five for all intents and purposes is about 50 miles a minute. Uh, so the rough rule of thumb, it's not exact. At 25,000 feet, it tends to almost correlate, but it's about uh, Mach 1 is about 10 miles a minute. So uh, keep that as a reference frame. So think about that, 50 miles a minute. You're almost going a mile a second. So at this point now, like you're you're there waiting for the customer, the government, with, with the product ready to go. Is that like an accurate description of... If, if they want to start putting dollars towards this thing, then additive manufacturing, all of the components are there. It's all, it's all the, right, the, the supply lines are all established. This thing can go into production fairly quickly. So uh, in general, yes. So we've been ready uh, past 18 months. We haven't been on contract for 18 months uh, since we know, but 
Uh, we are still ready to move out rapidly, whether that is the traditional route going through the, what, as I stated, that full EMD phase, engineering, manufacturing decision phase, and all of the milestones that, that occur there. It's, it's, it's um, well, it's very prescriptive. Or we could go into something uh, traditionally called a, a rapid prototyping. So if a customer wanted to, hey, let's, Let's let's build one of these things. Let's let's Elon Musk this, you know, SpaceX, SpaceX. Let's let's fail fast, fail early if need be, and learn from it. And let's get this out there uh, as as soon as possible in the warfighter. We we could take that route also. Yes, we were at the point where we had the um, global supply chain, the, the supply lines identified. Uh, we we had all of that lined up, but we we didn't go to the next piece, which which was to get onto that EMD contract. So we could we could pivot fairly fast. Now we haven't been just sitting around the past eighteen months. Uh, we have continued to look internationally. We've continued to keep our um, our domestic partners here uh, uh, up to speed on what's going on. The U.S. government and various services have have asked for various briefs over the past 18 months, keeping an awareness of where we are. We've looked at alternative warheads in that timeline. And I think the biggest, the biggest thing that has occurred is the, as you brought up, Brian, the additive manufacturing piece. Since the inception seven years ago of Mako, the world has changed uh, from, from a, from a, you know, manufacturing standpoint. We are able to, I'm not going to throw out dollars here. I'll just give you percentages and orders of magnitude. But we are able to take something that used to, for instance, the guidance housing up front used to be made out, we, we call it subtractive manufacturing, not additive, subtractive, meaning you take this very expensive piece of metal, you hog it out, uh, you weld stuff together. It takes a lot of time and, and it's very wasteful. With additive manufacturing, now we're actually building up that component from the constituent parts. And we are able to do that. And I'm not kidding here in one tenth of the time and one tenth the cost. That's that's revolutionary. That's not evolutionary. That's significant. And that's because the advances in production capability uh, for the better balance of a decade have, have changed tremendously. It's not just about the, uh, the quality that has to remain, but it's the quantity. How many of these units can you put out per month? And as we've seen in Ukraine and other places, it, it, it's about production capability and it's about getting weapons out there quickly. If you can just make one or two a year, what's the point? Uh, if But if you can ramp up and produce at rate and do it from, uh, from, a, from a cost perspective, that's, that's attractive. Last question I had for you, Fish, as a former fighter pilot, how much would you have wanted the Mako in, in your bays if you could have had it? So, so thank you for asking that. This was the weapon that I always wanted. That's why I, I'm so passionate about this. I still have uh, many of my junior officers from 10 years ago are now out there as the commanding officers of fighter squadrons. Uh, so when my training officers to my squadron now uh, drive around, uh, the nation's capital ships, our aircraft carriers, the most capable ships in the world. I made a promise to them, and I want to keep that promise. I need to get the best equipment to them because there's storm clouds on the horizon, and we want to make sure through strength that, that we have peace. And it's, it's important. This is what I wanted on my aircraft, and I know this is what they want also. That was perfect, Fish. Really appreciate it. Thank you so much.